Hey, y'all, it's an honor to share with you this Easter. Uh, I hope you're having an amazing time with your family. And while I know many of our Easter plans have changed, uh, for instance, my family had to cancel uh, a planned holiday we organized like four months ago with a friend. But it's okay because, you know, we'll just delay the holiday and do it another time. But to be honest, at first it was hard for me to get excited about Easter because I kind of made a choice to focus on all the things that I was missing out on. But about a week ago, uh, I decided to get excited and to find the moments of gold in our different Easter celebration. And I really hope for you, you've been able to find these moments of gold with your Easter celebration at home. This afternoon, uh, night, or morning, depending you know, when, you're, when you're watching this, I want to share with you a story that really has shown me to have hope. Because this upside down kingdom based on self-sacrificial love is a love that has hope. And on Easter Sunday, we look at stories found in the gospel about the resurrection of Jesus. And we remember this and celebrate this amazing time. I mean, Jesus is the reason for the season of Easter, pretty much. And honestly, honestly, though, looking at these stories, it shows us how this upside down kingdom based on self-sacrificial love is a love that has hope. And today I want to look at one of these stories of the resurrection of Christ found in the gospel of Mark. And it's Mark uh, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. But before we dive into our story, I want to look at the context because context is key when it comes to understanding Scripture. And this story of the resurrection takes place, with no surprise, after the death of Jesus on the cross. The thing I do find interesting, though, is before this story, in Mark 15, verses 42 to 47, we read about Joseph of Arimathea. Arimatha? Yeah, it's probably not right. You can, you know, you can YouTube that's your assignment to figure out the correct pronunciation. But he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. And he goes and asks Pilate for Jesus's body. And Pilate at first is a bit surprised. Like, really, Jesus is already dead? That was really quick. So he sends someone to go check. Person comes back and I'm like, yeah, Jesus dead. So then Pilate's like, all right, you can have the body. Joseph takes him, wraps him in some cloth. And he takes him to a tomb cut out of rock. And he puts Jesus inside. And then it tells us a big stone is rolled in front. And this is to make sure his followers couldn't anoint him for burial or they were a bit worried about him playing hide and seek with his body because he talked about all that resurrection stuff. And then Mark ends after telling us all of this by telling us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Josie, Joseph, uh, Joe's, we'll call him Joe's, were watching where he was laid. So you got these two Marys kind of watching, just trying to figure out where Jesus is laid. And then Mark 15 ends. And then we get to our story that I want to look at today. So if you have your Bible or the Bible app, feel free to open it up to Mark 16, verses 1 to 8. And let's just, yeah, read this story together. So this is how it starts. Uh, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salem bought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now let's just pause there for a moment. Because three women who were close to Jesus and grieving his death, are going to his tomb. 
trying to figure out a way to still, you know, pay him respect, do the proper things that it's custom in their culture and really go through this grieving process. And they're still trying to come to terms. I mean, I reckon their emotions would have been spilling out like all of ours do in times of grief. I mean, I remember when my grandma passed away when I was six. And uh, on the day of her funeral, I had to go to school to do a project. And we had to pretend to be, you know, weather presenters. And I think we even had like a you know, fake TV because I was in elementary school. So they weren't going to put a real TV by a little kid. So it was like a fake pretend TV. And we had to put coloring up there. But I got up there. I thought I was fine. And then I just broke down crying. Because grief is a tough thing to deal with. So I can only imagine the pain these women are going through as they approach the tomb. And I believe that's why they kind of start talking about practical things. Because, you know, sometimes when emotions are high, we just want to focus on some practical things. Get out of our own head. Get out of the emotions. Let's just be practical. So they're like, oh, you know, who's going to roll away the stone? And then it's kind of like they, they look up for a moment. So they're, you know, probably have their heads down working through all this and they look up and the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. I mean, could you imagine in this moment with all the emotions going on, all the grief, all the pain, all the things you're trying to come to terms with? And the hundreds of thoughts going through your mind, could you imagine all of that happening as you're approaching this tomb? Let's keep reading to see how this resurrection story continues. And this is what we read. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they put him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. I mean, wow, could you imagine that? Rushing into a tomb, seeing a stone rolled away and all this grief and stuff you're going through. And then you go in and there's a man dressed in white where Jesus should be. And it tells us they are alarmed. And I think it's for good reason, because it's kind of like Jesus should be there. But he's not there. He's not in the tomb. He, he's gone. And there's some man dressed in white. This young man dressed in white, who's got a white robe, it, what's it tells us, uh, tells them not to be alarmed. And then is like, Jesus has risen. And he's like, look, his body's gone. You want proof? It's not well, there. He's He's gone. Jesus is risen. And then he tells them to go tell the others he will be waiting in Galilee and that they'll see him there, just as he told them. I think for me, I like to pause for a moment and just think, what do you think they're going to do in this moment? I mean, all these emotions are at play. All the grief, all the pain, all the loss. And then you get there and wait, Jesus' body's not there. The stone's been rolled away. He's risen. Like, I could only imagine what would be going through my head. What would be going through my brain? How overwhelmed with emotions I would be. So let's just read to see how these three women respond. And this is what it tells us. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Wait, so they just left without saying anything to this young man dressed in white. who's kind of like Jesus is gone. He's risen. They say nothing. And it tells us because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And then our story ends with, and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. 
And if you look down, pause for a moment. If you look down, you'll see some little uh, text, probably. or so, You might have a, you know, a little symbol for a footnote. And if you read what the footnote is, it will say something like this. Some of the earliest manuscripts conclude with Mark 16, 8. What that means is the earliest manuscripts that they found of Mark's gospel ended right here. And it's, you got to ask yourself, is that really how this resurrection story in Mark ends? The abruptness of this ending has caused many responses over the years. Earlier readers uh, added a more appropriate conclusion because it really seemed lacking. While some modern interpreters have claimed that the original ending kind of got lost in the sands of time because, you know, it was a different world back then, paper was more expensive, and, and things could happen. So they've just dumbed it down to, oh, that rest of the end just, you know, got lost in time. Scholars of the past century, though, they found some liturgy and like rhetorical go goal out of the whole theme of the gospel with how, you know, maybe that's how Mark wanted to end it, just with the woman in si women in silence. And it's been over, you know, 30 years since J. Lee Magison presented his compelling argument that Mark's gospel intentionally ends abruptly at 16.8 in order to draw readers to participate in the story and create an ending of their own. And today I'm not going to solve this mystery uh, of, you know, this was Mark's original plan or if it got lost in the sands of times or anything like that. And I'm not just counting the things after it all. I'm just wanting to take a look at it because could we ever just sit and imagine the range of emotions an audience might have felt having the story in there. If you one of these earlier manuscripts, if you're sitting down hearing this gospel, hearing this story, and then it just ends. The women said nothing to no one because they were afraid. And that's it. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine the emotions that would be stirring up in me. And obviously, they told someone at some point about it, right? Because we even find out the little bit that happened at the tomb. So at some point, they must have said something. But I feel like this resurrection story ends in a way that invites us to participate in this upside-down kingdom with a love that has hope. Easter is a time that shows us we can have hope because God has overcome death. This abrupt ending of the Gospel of Mark found in earlier manuscripts really shows me this upside down kingdom of love has hope. And it really cries out to me, there is no good news unless someone shares it. So in this time where I'm not getting to celebrate Easter like normal due to the pandemic, and I'm sure others are experiencing the same thing, and when we can see fear and hopelessness gripping our society more and more, are we going to participate in this story of resurrection by sharing the good news of, the, of Christ with others? living out of this upside-down kingdom with a love that has hope. And I want to share with you a really, uh, probably people would know this quote, but it's a really famous quote from uh, St. Francis of Assisi, which he's an amazing guy if you want to read up about him. But this is what his quote says, Preach the Gospels at all times. When necessary, use words. And let's just sit with that for a second. And I'll read it again. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. I mean, that's big. Are we willing to share this love 
that has hope by first our actions and then by our words if required? I mean, that's a, that's a tricky thing to think, and you might be asking, you know, what does that look like? How do, how do I kind of do that? And that sounds all well and good, but how, what does that mean? And for me, it can mean a lot of different things, but I think it means that people know that you're a Christian not because you say it all the time, not because you go to church or you know a million Bible verses. They know you're a Christian by the way you treat others by the way you love others, by the way you help people who are downtrodden, by the way you support people, by the way you hold space for people when they need someone to hold them a space and just journey through stuff, by the way they see you treat your family. You know, I hope people can tell when I'm in a shopping center with my kids, even when my kids are throwing tantrums like any kids do, that I'm a Christian not because I, you know, blurt it out, because they can see the love I'm having for my kids, even in the hard times. And that's what I think it really means for us, or for me at least. So are we willing to live out of this upside down kingdom with a love that has hope this Easter? And there's a lot of simple ways we can do that this Easter. It could, you know, I know we can't see people face to face, but we could you know, post something up on social media. Use that to our advantage. Use that to connect with others. Start some conversation with that or reach out to others in that. Uh, we could even bless a neighbor or a friend. Like we might know people who are doing it rough. Or even if they're doing it rough or not, we might just want to take someone some chocolate because everyone loves chocolate on Easter, right? So you might want to go take some chocolate. Take them a big chocolate bunny. I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's still so many ways we could live out of this upside down kingdom that has hope the love that has hope. And our world really needs that. We really need that. Because I don't know about anyone else, the news gets old after a while. It's just coronavirus and then there's more stuff happening, especially being American, looking at what's happening back home while I'm here in Australia. It, it scares me. But I have to find ways to live out this upside down kingdom with a love that has hope. And I really want to encourage you to do that this Easter. And it could be as simple as posting stuff, calling friends, blessing a neighbor with chocolate or a friend with some chocolate because, you know, it's Easter, eat some chocolate. It's good on Easter. So I don't know what it looks like, but I really want to encourage you in that. Just during this Easter, live with a love that has hope. So I'll close in prayer. So again, if you want to close your eyes, feel free. If you want to keep them open and look at the bald spot on my head as I put my head down to pray, you can do that as well. And you can leave some comments about, you know, how 30s hit me really rough. But I just want to, you know, close in prayer. God, I really thank you for who you are. I thank you for your amazing love that's shown to us on the cross. I thank you for your love that has hope. Your love that shows us the story's not over. You've won the victory, but our, the story's not over. We can participate in it. You're inviting us to be a part of it, to be a part of this upside down kingdom and live with a love that has hope. And I just pray this Easter that you'll bless families across the world, that you'll bless anyone watching this. You'll bless our church and you'll help us to find moments of gold with our different Easter celebration. You'll help us find ways to live out of this upside down kingdom, to help others to have hope, to help ourselves to have hope. And I just really ask all of this in your amazing name, God. Amen. Thank y'all and have an amazing Easter.